So why is it that so many zoos seem to have such a confusing layout, making it impossible to find your favorite animals? Well, historically, zoos would have kept things very straightforward. They would have rows of cages with big cats or primates or birds, almost laying out their collections just like a textbook. Now, while most modern zoos have moved away from those enclosures, organizing by taxonomy is something which is relatively common. Whether primate houses with expansive outdoor exhibits for each species, whether a communal plain with a variety of different hoof stock, or possibly just an area of your park where you have several different enclosures all housing big cats from around the world. There are some benefits to this type of design. Now, from a visitor point of view, it's really nice to be able to see different related species side by side. Visitors are gonna be able to see any adaptations that they might have which are common, across all of the taxa, or alternatively differences that different species have evolved for their local habitats. As well as being educational and engaging for visitors, it can also be very cost effective for the zoo itself. Whether that be in terms of building communal back of house areas where perhaps you have heightened security required to house those animals, or possibly in terms of the heating and lighting requirements of certain species. And this is quite common with things like reptile houses. Now, part of the reason for this is that it's a lot cheaper to heat an entire building and then have as many individual enclosures as you want within it than taking individual reptile enclosures, putting them outside, and then having to insulate and heat those each individually. Now, one problem with the taxonomic layout is that it can be quite difficult to weave conservation narratives into those enclosures. While there are many common problems affecting different species all over the world, Chances are an individual zoo wants to talk about their conservation partners or conservation initiatives, which in the case of less well-known or less popular species, they're going to struggle to get the same attention as another very similar species who lives next door. Now discussing conservation with a zoo visitor simply there on a fun day out, it can be quite tricky. And I feel it's much easier to talk about conservation when you're focused on a particular place rather than a particular species. And this is where biogeographical layouts can be really impactful. The concept that you divide your park by the area of the world in which they would be found. Now this gives you an opportunity to house a range of different species, some of them particularly high profile and popular, others less so, which can be really beneficial as well as making it that much more exciting for the visitors. It's actually been shown with chimpanzees, for example, that having them in your collection alongside less well-known species raises the overall conservation potential and perception for these species which otherwise may have gone overlooked. Now, from a visitor point of view, this type of organization can also be that little bit more engaging. If you were to head to your collection, you're gonna have certain animals which are your favorites. And chances are you can have certain groups of animals as well, perhaps choosing to overlook the reptile house or the bird enclosures, because you're simply not as interested. However, having these areas where you have a variety of different taxa all side by side, you may happen upon something which you otherwise may not have taken much notice to, but in this instance, as part of this wider biogeographical trend, all of a sudden, they are more interesting. Now, one flaw to this organization system is you are still limited in your choices. If you're starting from a blank slate, it might be very easy to look at animals from all over the region, and you seem to have a really wide variety of choices. However, further down the line, if a completely different species becomes available, you have some choices that you're gonna need to make. Do you simply ignore your theme and kind of pop it in and hope nobody notices? Do you have this large flagship area with a variety of species and then almost a standalone single exhibit just alongside it? Or do you stick strictly to your theme, turning down the opportunity to have either a commercially very important species or perhaps one which has incredibly high conservation value? And that's really just a thought and a discussion for an individual zoo in terms of their own collection planning. But when you consider the wider zoo industry, is there the risk that this type of enclosure is going to lead to lots of zoos with very similar enclosures, or possibly certain species being completely removed from zoos altogether? You see, there's a variety of different species which people have come to expect to see when they go to a collection. Now, as those developments happen with these flagship species in mind, there are whole areas of the world which are perhaps deemed less interesting, less engaging, or with less options. 
So for those species which are from there, there is the risk that there'll be less appetite to have them within collections. Now, obviously finding a balance here about how you organize your collection and the flexibility which you're willing to take is going to be very important. But there is another type of organization structure which I think lends itself to this incredibly well, and that is biotype theming. Now, the global biotype map is incredibly varied. There's a number of different habitat types which are found throughout the world and not just simply in one geographical area. Each of these biotypes houses a range of different species across the taxa, so from an education point of view, this is a really great opportunity. You're able to talk about the adaptations that species will have, as well as probably talking about the various conservation issues which those types of habitats will struggle with. Now, from a theming point of view, you're able to allude to different habitats without relying on any sort of cultural cues. Now, moving forward, this allows you to adapt and change your collection constantly because you haven't pigeonholed yourself simply into African savanna, but the savanna landscapes which are found all over the world. Now, unlike biogeographical organization, for each individual species here, you have a bit more flexibility about which categories they may get put into. And that's because for many different species, their natural habitats are a mosaic of different biotypes. So for an individual species, the possible range of exhibit design and exhibit organizations that they fall within can be quite varied. And this can be really helpful as you develop your park over time and the different opportunities for new species which might be offered to you. Now, from a conservation standpoint, again, it can be a little bit tricky. The benefits of a flagship species here might not be quite as impactful, but because you have these similar habitats, the concept that it's happening across the world is going to be something that people are able to take home with them. Now, I personally like the opportunities that this type of organization has and the flexibility which it has moving forward, as well as the excitement for us as visitors, sort of unknowingly stumbling across species that perhaps we'd never expected to see. Now, I'd like to know what your favorite exhibit is. Not necessarily a single exhibit with single species, but a collection of exhibits that you feel has been organized in a way which has been particularly engaging to you. Now, if you had the opportunity to design whatever kind of collection you wanted, chances are you'd start wondering where those animals might come from. And if you want to know where zoos get theirs, why not check out this video here?